postdoctoral researcher in the reinforcement learning group at Microsoft Research. Before this, he was a postdoc in the computer science department at UT Austin, where he also completed his PhD, uh, working on reinforcement learning for robotics. Uh, Patrick received both bachelor's and master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Drumroll, Rice University. Uh, so his research spans the areas of autonomous multi-agent systems, machine learning and robotics. And today he's going to be talking to us about layered learning and multi-agent coordination. Uh, with that, Patrick, take it away. Great. Yes. So today I'll be talking about some machine learning methods and also some multi-agent coordination algorithms that have been applied successfully to a robot soccer domain. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll also highlight some work on applying what's learned in simulation to the real world, as well as work on generalization and reinforcement learning uh, that are related to my longer term research goals. And I'd also like to mention that while I'm happy to take uh, questions during this talk, I also plan to periodically pause for questions after presenting different uh, sections. Now, first however, I'd like to give just a high level view of my research. Uh, my work lies at the intersection of robotics, multi-agent systems, and machine learning, and uh, in particular, reinforcement learning. And at this intersection, I found robot soccer to be an excellent test bed for a lot of the work that I've done. Now to begin, I'd like to give some motivation for the work I'll be talking about. Now with improvements in technology, robots are having increased capabilities and are also becoming cheaper to manufacture. In fact, the Boston Consulting Group estimates that by the year 2025, around 1.2 million additional advanced robots are expected to be deployed in the, the US alone. And this includes both industrial and domestic settings such as robots uh, walking around a house. Now, when we do have more robots, there's a desire for robots to be able to act uh, autonomously as we may expect that with more robots, it's less likely to have a person trained to directly control them. So here's a video from the DARPA Robotics Challenge for getting semi-autonomous robots to do complex tasks such as walking upstairs as you see here. Here's a robot uh, trying to open a valve. And at the end of the video, there's a robot trying to step out of a car after driving it. And we would like these robots to be able to perform complex tasks uh, consisting of multiple skills, uh, such as a robot driving a car and then stepping out of the car. But as you can see, there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. And we'd like to be able to learn some skills for these robots so they can act more autonomously. Now, in addition, with more robots, it's likely we'll have more robots existing in the same environment together. And when that happens, we would like the robots to coordinate, uh, particularly their movement, and potentially be able to work together such that we don't uh, have robots crash into each other like you see in this video. So movement coordination among robots is also something that is very important. Now, before I dive into robot soccer, I wanna give a high level view of some of the research questions I'll be looking to address today. Uh, as a focus, I'm interested in developing complex multi-agent behaviors for agents, potentially robots, uh, to be able to act autonomously and coordinate their actions or movements in order to complete real world tasks asked of them. Now, one question or focus in this area is that of hierarchical skill learning. Basically, when end to end learning is not feasible, a question arises of how can we use machine learning to learn multiple skills or behaviors for mobile robots such that the skills will work well together? Uh, for instance, maybe having a robot be able to walk and push something at the same time, or in the context of robot soccer, being able to walk and and kick a soccer ball at the same time. And, and I'd also like to talk about movement coordination, in particular, how we can get robots to coordinate their movement and complete tasks, ideally in as little time as possible, without having the robots collide with each other. Okay, so now on to robot soccer. Uh, this is in the context of something called RoboCup, which is an annual competition, uh, started a little over 20 years ago, and to the best of my knowledge, is currently the largest international uh, robotics competition in the world. Now, RoboCup consists of many different autonomous robot soccer leagues. And by autonomous, I mean that once a game starts, the robots just start playing soccer. There is no human controlling them at that point. I have some examples on the slide of some different robot soccer leagues at RoboCup. Uh, on the left is the uh, standard platform league where everyone uses the same robot, uh, now robots. Uh, so this is more of a software competition. In the middle is a league where people actually design their own robots. So there's more of a hardware aspect to it. And then on the right, uh, we have a league in simulation, the 3D Simulation League, uh, which I'll be talking about a lot today. Now, the overarching goal driving research forward in RoboCup is to have a team of fully autonomous humanoid robots uh, be able to beat the human World Cup champions by the year 2050. So every year, the competition to gauge how things are going towards that goal, there is a game between robots and humans. In this case, the robots are still on wheels. They're, they're not humanoid at this point. 
And as you can see, the humans don't have too much trouble uh, beating the robots. Now these are aging roboticists beating the robots, mind you, and not a world-class soccer player like Messi. So there's still a lot of work to do to uh, meet this goal by 2050. Now there are a lot of general challenges that uh, come up in RoboCup pertaining to multi-agent systems and autonomous robots. Uh, one of these is a, a vision challenge. Uh, robots need to be able to see the ball and see their teammates to be able to play soccer. Um, localization is also an important problem. In most of the leagues, robots aren't explicitly told where they are on the field. They have to observe different landmarks around them, such as goalposts and field lines to figure out where they are. Um, another problem is locomotion. That's uh, particularly important for robots that are bipedal and walk on two legs. And of course, uh, teamwork also comes into play. Uh, robots from a multi-agent systems perspective need to be able to communicate and coordinate to execute some strategy uh, to be able to play soccer. Now, among these challenges, I'm mainly going to focus on some of the locomotion and teamwork challenges uh, during today's talk. Now, as I alluded to earlier, uh, a lot of my work takes place in what's known as the RoboCup 3D simulation domain. This is where teams of 11 versus 11 simulated autonomous robots play soccer against each other. And the robots are modeled after the now robot uh, and they control themselves by asking that different torques be applied to their joints and then sending them to a, a central game server. So this is what a RoboCup 3D simulation game actually looks like. I believe this is the uh, beginning of a final championship match, uh, maybe from 2016, where the team in left uh, in blue is Foot K. They're from Japan, and they're playing against our team, UT Austin Villa, uh, in the sort of burnt orange Texas color. And you can see the robots can kick the ball over half the distance of the field, and they can also walk around fairly well. And the robots are also reasonably stable, although if one robot crashes into another, so you'll, you'll see right there, they can get penalized and are moved off to the sideline of the field. Um, also, sometimes robots collide and, and fall over, uh, and they have to be able to get back up again right there. Um, and you can see that we're able to pass the ball with some nice teamwork to an open forward, which then has the propensity to gather itself to take a shot and, and score a goal. Now, things weren't always that nice and looking like actual soccer, however. Just to give you a starting point from where we came from, uh, this is uh, what our RoboCup 3D simulation team looked like from 2007 to 2009, uh, when the, the team first started. Now this uh, robot in this grainy video has a slow and kind of plodding walk as it tries to dribble the ball. And as you might imagine with this behavior, we didn't score any goals or, or win any games. So now in 2010, which is the first year I was introduced to RoboCup, the team put in a lot of effort trying to improve the walk and become more competitive so we ended up with something like this that allowed us to finally score some goals and win some games. However, this walk is still kind of jerky with the robots sometimes hesitant around the ball and maybe not quite sure what to do at times. So the team was looking for something a little smoother than this. Uh, furthermore, we found that stability can be a bit of an issue with this walk as the robot can be unstable and fall over at uh, opportune times, such as when it's just about to score a goal. And as you'll see right here, uh, unfortunate things happen. Patrick, I think there is a question. Uh huh. Hi, Patrick. This is Ashu. Um, just wanted to uh, get a little bit quick context. In this case, um, what is the simulation or what are the constraints you're working under? That means, are there some physics constraints which you can't violate? And yes. You get a, okay. Yeah, the, the physics are uh, simulated through the Open Dynamics Engine, which is this uh, third party library that uh, uh, provides physics for us for the simulator. I mean, they're reasonably realistic, but obviously they're not perfect. Um, for instance, mm -hmm. robots can uh, move, uh, uh, motors uh, can move a lot faster. They're not realistic to actual like servos on a, on a real robot. I see, so, but you don't get to define the physics. It's somebody else defines the physics and you have to live with that physics. That's correct. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, um, so I just showed you what uh, things were like in 2010. However, uh, over the past nine years, uh, things have changed a lot and, and really improved for the team. Uh, from the years 2011 to 2019, instead of just scoring 11 goals, the team has scored close to 900, so about 100 uh, uh, a year. Um, over that same time, the, the team has just conceded 12 goals, which is less than the single year amount in 2010 when the, the team gave up 17. And as you might expect, the team has been able to win most of its games and has won the World Championship eight out of the past nine years while finishing second in 2013. So this is a really big improvement for the team over the past nine years from where it was originally. And so you might ask, what's uh, the reason for success here? What's the 
the secret sauce that has allowed the team to keep winning and stay at the top of the league. So that's what I'm going to be talking about next, uh, detailing a couple of contributions of my dissertation work that were keys to the UT Austin Villa team success. Uh, the first of these is something called overlapping layer learning that was used to learn skills for robots. And then I'm going to talk about the role assignment problem and some multi-agent coordination algorithms. Now, this talk began with some motivation for learning skills for robots. First of all, it's very hard to learn the complete task of playing soccer all at once. It's just not tractable to do so and perform end-to-end -end learning. Therefore, we want to break up learning into learnable subtasks using hierarchical learning. And in particular, when we're learning different sub-behaviors or skills, we want them to be able to work together. Uh, so what I mean by this is, suppose we have a robot that has learned a, a kicking skill here, and maybe it's also learned a, a walking skill, but when we try and combine the walk directly into the kick, the robot is unstable and falls over. So we want to develop skills that will work well together. Now the type of learning we're going to be using is reinforcement learning. Uh, for any of you who may not be familiar with that, here's a basic high-level view of reinforcement learning. So typically we have an agent existing in an environment, and at every time step, the agent observes some current state of the environment and then chooses an action to take. The agent will receive a reward after taking an action. And a lot of times in reinforcement learning, what we're trying to do is learn a policy that maps uh, states to actions such that we'll maximize some, uh, a sum of possibly uh, discounted by this gamma term here, uh, rewards over time. So that's a, a very high level view of reinforcement learning. However, in our case, we're actually going to be performing learning in policy space, doing something called episode-based direct policy search, where we're not actually learning a direct mapping of states to actions, but instead we're learning parameters for a policy that will determine what actions to take based on the current state of the world. Now to do that, we'll have an optimization algorithm or, or learning algorithm that will produce candidate sets of parameters for our policy, and then we'll have an agent executing some learning or optimization task to test out how well it can do with those parameters for this policy. Now in the case of robot soccer, such a task, uh, which I'll talk more about later, uh, might be walking or, or kicking a soccer ball. And at the conclusion of the task, uh, also known as the end of an episode, the agent receives an overall reward, return, or what's sometimes called a fitness for how well it's done on that task. Now, say for instance, when kicking a soccer ball, it might be how far the ball has traveled, as an example. Now then based on that feedback, the optimization algorithm will come up with uh, new sets of parameters to try for the policy that it thinks will allow the agent to better and receive a higher fitness on that optimization task. Now, the algorithm we'll be using for learning is CMAS, which stands for Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolutionary Strategy. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how this algorithm works, as it's more of a tool that we're using and not a direct contribution, but I'll say that it's an evolutionary numerical optimization method. Uh, that means it's generation and population based. And what it does is it samples members for a population from a multivariate Gaussian distribution, and then from one generation of learning to the next, we'll try and adjust that distribution to higher fitness areas in the parameter policy search space. Uh, so if you're familiar with a natural gradient descent, uh, CMAS is uh, approximating that as it searches over parameters in the policy search space. Now the basis for the type of learning we're gonna be doing is layered learning. So layered learning is a hierarchical machine learning paradigm that enables learning of uh, complex behaviors by incrementally learning a series of sub behaviors with a key tenet of layer learning being that higher layers of layer learning uh, directly depend on previously learned behaviors and lower layers of learning. So to give you an idea uh, of, uh, of what this means, uh, I have a couple paradigms for this, which I have uh, some block diagrams of for layer learning. Now in these diagrams, rectangles represent different parameterized behaviors we're trying to learn, and they're colored in red if uh, we're currently learning parameters for that behavior, and if we've already learned parameters for behavior and then have frozen them, uh, we'll color that black uh, in white. And now the arrows represent the transition from one layer of learning uh, to the next. Now, the first paradigm shown by the doc, uh, block diagram on the left is uh, what's called sequential layer learning. Now, in this case, we, uh, we learn some behavior and then freeze the parameters for that behavior uh, before uh, uh, we go on to uh, learning the behavior in the next layer of learning. Uh, so that's uh, sequential layer learning. Now, it, uh, one aspect of this, however, is that during the learning process, the previously learned behavior is used as input as we learn the new behavior in the next layer of learning. Now, in contrast to that, there's concurrent layer learning uh, shown in the block diagram on the, on the right, where instead of freezing the parameters from our previously learned behavior, uh, we keep them open and continue to learn them during the next layer of learning. 
Now, however, there are a couple of problems we've noticed for these paradigms. With uh, sequential layer learning, we find that it sometimes can be too limiting in the constrained behavior policy search space to learn a behavior that works well, uh, as well as we would like it to. This is due to having frozen parameter values that we had previously learned. Now with concurrent layer learning, on the other hand, the increased dimensionality from having left uh, all the parameters open during each subsequent layer of learning uh, can make learning harder or intractable. So a contribution of my dissertation is something called overlapping layer learning, which is trying to find a trade-off between freezing or keeping open parameters of previously learned behaviors. Uh, essentially what this is trying to do is optimize the scene or overlap between these behaviors, which keeps some parts of previously learned layers open uh, during subsequent learning. Now we've identified three paradigms for overlapping layer learning I'm going to go over, which we find particularly useful and all of which we've used to build up skills for our RoboCup 3D simulation soccer team. Uh, the first paradigm uh, called combining independently learned behaviors is where we have two or more behaviors that we've learned independently and in parallel, and then we combine them by relearning some subset of uh, the behavior's parameters during the next layer of learning. Now, this is particularly useful when you may have two behaviors that interfere with each other or are hard to learn directly in the presence of each other uh, that we, we may want to combine later. And I'll be giving a concrete example of that shortly. Uh, the second paradigm is called partial concurrent layer learning. This is where only part, but not all, of a previously learned layer's behaviors are left open uh, during the, the next layer of learning. And this is essentially a trade-off or middle ground between sequential layer learning and concurrent layer learning. And finally, we have previously learned layer refinement. Uh, so in this paradigm, after a behavior is learned and, and then frozen, and then a subsequent behavior is learned, in the next layer of learning, uh, we then unfreeze some of those parameters from the original learned behavior and start learning them again in the presence of behaviors. Uh, was there a question? Oh, okay. Uh, in the presence of behaviors that were learned after that initial behavior was learned. So this lets you refine a behavior's performance and work better with other behaviors that were learned uh, initially after it. Now, I just prevented, uh, presented some high-level paradigms for what overlapping layer learning constitutes, but now I wanna dive in and give you some concrete examples of how we've actually used some of them to learn complex tasks in the RoboCup 3D simulation domain. Now, in particular, I'm going to focus on the complex task of dribbling and kicking a ball in a goal. Now, so for this case, we're going to learn several walking subtasks for different walking behaviors uh, using sequential layer learning. This includes walking to general target positions on the field, uh, being able to sprint forward, and also being able to dribble a soccer ball. Then independently and parallel to that, we're going to learn a fixed kicking motion to be able to kick the ball. And then finally, through an overlapping behavior layer of learning, we're going to combine that kick with our walk so that they will work well together. Now to first start out with uh, how we learn to walk, we begin with this initial walk based on a double inverted pendulum model that was actually developed on a physical now robot and then ported over to simulation. And this omnidirectional walk has 25 different parameters uh, to control things such as the walk's step height, frequency, and also how the robot uh, controls its center of mass. And using these uh, parameters from the physical robot in simulation provides us a very slow and stable walk which we want to optimize these parameters to learn a faster and better walk that will be competitive in the 3D simulation league. To do that, uh, our first task that we use for optimization looks something like an obstacle course, where we have a robot trying to move towards a pink dot on the field as a, an ever moving target. The robot is given a reward for the distance it's able to travel towards that target, and it's given a penalty if it ever falls over because we care about uh, stability. Now we actually use this optimization task to learn two different walk parameter sets for our, our walk engine. For the first walk parameter set, we run the optimization and learn a walk for just going to general target positions on the field. And that's active when there's a red T above the robot's head. And then once we have learned that first task, we then freeze the parameters for that learned walk and then rerun the optimization to learn a new walk parameter set uh, for sprinting, which is used when the robot is plus or minus 15 degrees of the current target it's uh, moving towards. Now the sprinting walk parameter set, which is currently being learned in the video, is active when you see a yellow S above the robot's head. Now also what you're seeing during the learning process is that the robot is switching between the sprinting walk parameter set that it's currently learning and the previously learned one with the red T that it uses to move to general target positions. So by involving the previous learned B, uh, parameter set in the, the previous, uh, or in the process of learning, the new one, we make sure that uh, they will actually work well together so this is a, an example of a sequential layer learning. 
Now, an example of why we need to use layered learning to learn separate uh, walks. If suppose we were to learn two separate walks independently and then try and combine them, such as a slow walk here represented by a red D above the robot's head, and then a faster walk shown with a yellow F above the robot's head, we see that sometimes if we try and switch between the two walks, uh, the robot becomes unstable and, and falls on its face. So this is why we need to use layered learning such that the walks are learned with a transition dynamic between them. Now, while I've talked a little bit about walk learning, uh, in parallel and independent of that, we also learn a kick for a robot. In this case, the kick is represented by a series of poses where the poses themselves are parametrized by different joint angles we want the robot to move through in a kicking motion as it kicks the ball. To learn a kicking motion, we have an optimization task where the robot is placed behind the ball and attempts to kick the ball as, uh, as far as it can. It's rewarded for the distance the ball travels. Now, in this video, the robot is executing the task after learning, which is why it can kick the, fall, uh, the ball as far as it's uh, currently doing. But this is how our robot learns a, a basic kicking motion. Now, finally, we want to combine our learned kick and walk together uh, through an overlapping uh, layer of learning. Now, for this, we have a task where the robot starts at different positions behind the ball and then is asked to walk up to the ball and kick it. Now, to get the, work, uh, get the kick to work with the walk, we reopen many of the parameters of the kick and relearn them in the presence of the walk. So this allows the kick to adjust and be stable to different starting positions uh, for executing the kick as the robot walks up to the ball as opposed to starting in a, a fixed standing position when it initially learned to kick. Now this is an example of combining independently learned behaviors. Uh, to provide some data, however, on why it's important to use overlapping layer learning versus some other layer learning paradigms, I'd like to show some learning curves comparing different layer learning paradigms. Now in this graph on the x-axis, we have the number of generations of learning for uh, CMAS. And on the y-axis, uh, we show the kick distance or really fitness for learning a, a kick behavior. Now the first learning curve in green is for concurrent layer learning. Uh, let me first say that the, the top line is the best or highest fitness for each generation. And the bottom line is the average fitness of all the members of population for each generation. Now in concurrent layer learning, uh, that's once again, where we've learned to walk and then keep that walk's parameters open as we start to learn a, a kick in the presence of that walk. And we found that the robot really struggles to learn a kick and walk approach to the ball at the same time because with the walk continually changing, uh, the kick just has trouble adjusting to working with the walk and a changing starting position to execute the kick from relative to the ball. Uh, now sequential layer learning, as shown in blue, does a little bit better. Uh, that's once again where we've learned a walk, but then have frozen it and start learning a kick directly in the presence of that frozen walk. And we still have some difficulty learning a kick, however, even in the presence of the frozen walk, as the walk is stochastic and it's still difficult for the kick to be learned from uh, continually different starting positions of kicking motion relative to the ball. And finally, we have overlapping layer learning uh, shown in red, uh, and that performs the best. This is where we first learned to walk and kick in parallel. Uh, but separately, and then combine them by reopening some of the parameters of the kick that allows it to adjust to the walk. So just to put everything together, this is what the whole task looks like as the robot is dribbling and kicking the ball. As the robot approaches the ball, you'll see it transitioning stably and seamlessly between different walk parameter sets. This includes the two I showed uh, earlier being learned, as well as a couple others for uh, we learned for dribbling and approaching the ball to kick it. And then once the robot nears the ball, uh, it seamlessly uh, transitions to perform a nice kicking motion and, and score a goal. Now, this is a block diagram of what was used for the UT Austin Villa team several years ago, consisting of 19 different learned behaviors for things like standing up, walking, and kicking. And the behaviors I just showed being learned are, are circled in purple. Now, this is three times more behaviors than any previously learned layer system that we're aware of. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into what all these behaviors are. Uh, but this just gives a feel of the scope of the learning process with each block being a, a different layer of learning. And in this diagram, the, the black arrows are representing different parameters that have been learned and then frozen, being passed from one layer uh, to the next. And then with the dashed red arrows representing parameters that have been left open for purposes of overlapping layer learning being moved from one layer of learning to the next. Uh, additionally, the blocks that are colored are those incorporating overlapping layer learning methodologies with the color corresponding to the particular paradigm that it's using. Now, overall- Patrick, uh, mm -hmm. quick question. Yes. Uh, yes. You mentioned in the last slide that the walking behavior is, has a statistical nature. What is the source of randomness? Oh, 
So there's uh, general randomness in the physics simulation. Okay, all right. So that's the only source of randomness, which is. Uh, yeah. Well, also robots receive uh, uh, perceptions that have noise added to them as well. Okay, so both the inputs and the outputs are to the robot are have some notion of noise. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Now, uh, overall, during the course of learning, we're optimizing over 500 different parameters using the CMAS algorithm. And computationally, that's evaluating around 700,000 parameter sets uh, through the course of learning. And we've estimated this would take roughly one and a half years of compute time to do all of this on a, a single computer. However, fortunately, we can take advantage of the parallelism of both the CMAES algorithm, as well as uh, overlapping layer learning methodologies and complete this in roughly five days on a distributed computing cluster. I just wanna mention as an aside that the block diagram is from several years ago. And as of 2019, we've extended this by uh, adding 25 new kicks and now overall have a, a total of 69 learned behaviors. And just want to show you one of these new behaviors that I think is really nice and demonstrates uh, what can be learned. This is a, a backwards kick that was uh, used to score a, a goal in one of our games. Now, one last learned behavior that I'd like to mention, uh, although I don't have much time to go into detail about it, is a multi-agent behavior. In the RoboCup 3D Simulation League, uh, kickoffs are indirect, um, which that means that one robot must touch the ball before another robot can kick it and have it be counted as a goal. So to get around this rule, we first learn behavior separately and in parallel for one robot to lightly touch the ball and for another robot to take a shot on goal. And then we used overlapping layer learning to combine these two behaviors into a multi-agent behavior. As you'll see here, this allowed us to immediately score at the beginning of every game when it was our kickoff. Uh, the goalie has no chance. And uh, after we did this, however, rules were changed to no longer allow that. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of all the overlapping layer learning components that went into learning that, that multi-agent behavior. But I will point out as an example of why it was needed to learn the touch and kick behavior separately. And this video is an example of two skills interfering with each other as we're trying to learn them. Unfortunately, as you see, one robot kicks another as they're trying to learn. And so learning didn't work when we tried to learn the skills with the robot standing directly next to each other. So this is another example of why learning behaviors independently and then combining them later with overlapping layered learning uh, is important. So as a quick summary of overlapping layered learning, it's a hierarchical machine learning paradigm that's well suited for learning behaviors or skills that will work well together. Uh, it's important to mention that overlapping layered learning is a paradigm, uh, not an algorithm. And so automating things such as the selection of overlapping parameters and behaviors is future work. And while we've shown its effectiveness of learning complex behaviors by our success in the RoboCup 3D simulation domain, uh, layer learning paradigms are general to hierarchical learning and applicable to many other domains such as other robots, uh, video games, traffic simulations, et cetera. Now with that, I'd like to just briefly pause if, if there are any questions. Patrick. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I have a high level question, kind of naive question. You mentioned earlier that um, uh, from simulations, uh, from uh, experiments with actual robots and all that, you added some uh, keys or some values to the simulations. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, is that, is that what you said? Yeah, we, we took uh, parameters that were hand tuned for the walk to work on a physical now robot, ported them to simulation along with the walk engine, and that was our starting point for learning. Okay, now I'm just curious, uh, in the other direction, has there been a lot of work in that in the space? Like, uh, are people actually doing that, that uh, learning from simulations, porting some of these ideas or strategies onto actual robots? Yes, uh, um, the game? They, yes they are, and that is actually gonna be in a couple sections from now, I'll talk about work on that. Excellent. Great, okay, so um, I think I'll move on. Uh, now I'd just like to shift gears and talk about a second contribution of my dissertation that went into the team, and that's for multi-agent coordination. Now to give some motivation for this, uh, suppose we have robots that we have learned uh, good skills for walking, and we want them to assume formations by moving to different target positions on the field. But if they just walk to new positions without coordinating their movement, they may run into each other and impede each other's progress, which is uh, not what we want. So this brings up something we refer to as the role assignment problem. This is a question of uh, how can we assign N interchangeable robots uh, represented by the circles in this example, A1 through A6, to N target positions represented by the crosses 
P1 through P6 in a one-to-one -one mapping such as the make span or time for all robots to reach their target positions is minimized while avoiding collisions among the robots. Now, before I get into how to perform such an assignment, I first want to make a few assumptions for theoretical analysis guarantees. Uh, the first of these is that no two robots or uh, targets occupy the same position. Secondly, we're going to approximate robots as being zero width point masses. And finally, we're going to assume that robots move at the same constant speed along straight line paths to their target destinations. Now, what we want to do is come up with some function that will assign robots to target positions. And in doing so, we want such an assignment generated by a function to have a couple properties. Uh, one, as I mentioned, is that it minimizes the make span. And secondly, that it avoids collisions. We say that a function that produces assignments with these properties is CM valid for having assignments that are collision avoiding with minimal make span. And a third property that's really desirable to have in an assignment, but not necessary for it to be CM valid, is something we refer to as being dynamically consistent. Now, by that I mean that the role assignments don't change or switch as the robots move towards their assigned target positions, as if they do, the robots can unduly thrash and never make enough progress towards moving to their target positions. Now, ultimately, we can think of the role assignment problem as trying to find a perfect matching in a fully connected bipartite graph for which there are n factorial possible mappings. Now, here I've drawn a CM valid role assignment for the example problem shown by the red arrows, which avoids collisions as the robots are moving to their targets, and it's also minimized the maximum distance that any robot has to travel. Now, we've come up with a couple functions I'm about to go into that are CM valid, once again, producing assignments that are collision avoiding with minimal make span. Uh, first, though, I want to provide some motivation for why we might care about minimizing the make span. Uh, there are a couple scenarios for which this is particularly important. One is where the time it uh, takes for the last robot to reach its target position is a bottleneck for some process being finished. An example of that might be robots on some warehouse floor trying to fulfill an order. And the second scenario is where robots may need to be synchronized before some job can start. Uh, maybe the robots all need to move to some starting positions on an assembly line uh, before it can start running. Now, the first role assignment I want to present that is C invalid is the minimum maximal distance recursive role assignment function, or MMBR. Now, what this function is doing is recursively minimizing the maximum distance that any robot must travel to its target position. Uh, to give you an example of how we can compute this, we can look at all n factorial possible mappings of robots to target positions. And then for each of these mappings, we can compute the distance for each robot to travel to its assigned target position. Uh, we then take all these distances for a mapping, put them into a vector, and sort that vector in decreasing order of distances. And this is what we call a mapping cost for any particular assignment. Then if we lexicographically sort all the n factorial mappings, uh, with lexicographical sort also sometimes known as dictionary sort, the lowest cost mapping will then be the MMBR role assignment. So just as a quick example in this figure, uh, uh, we show here a mapping of three agents to three targets. We've uh, computed and listed the mapping costs for all six potential mappings and then sorted them in lexicographical order. Now, if you look at the lowest cost one, which is drawn in the figure with the arrows, that looks like a good mapping that is collision avoiding and also minimizing the make span. However, we don't want to have to consider all n factorial possible assignments. We want our role assignment algorithms and functions to be scalable and ideally operate in polynomial time. Now, for an idea of how we might be able to compute the MMDR role assignment function in polynomial time, we can look at the Hungarian algorithm, which is a well-known algorithm for finding a minimum weight, or really a sum of weights, perfect matching in a bipartite graph. Uh, this is sometimes known as solving what's called the assignment problem and runs in n cubed time. So the question that we ask is, is it possible to transform the MMDR role assignment function into the role assignment problem such that we could leverage the polynomial time of the Hungarian algorithm? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but basically we can convert edge distances to be ordered bit vector weights. Uh, by that, I mean their ascending powers of two. And once we've done that, we can then pass these modified weights to the Hungarian algorithm. And the output of that will be the MMDR role assignment. And this runs in just end of the fifth time. Uh, it also uh, allows us to scale to hundreds of robots. And furthermore, we found that the MMDR role assignment function is dynamically consistent, which is really nice. The second role assignment function we've come up with that is CM valid is called the minimum maximal distance plus minimum sum distance squared or MMD plus MSD squared role assignment function. Now for this role assignment function, what we want to do first and foremost is find a perfect matching that has a minimal maximum edge, thereby minimizing the make span. 
And then secondly, we want to have it minimize the sum of distances squared, which we have uh, proven will avoid collisions. To compute this role assignment function, we can first find the minimal maximum edge in all potential perfect matchings using the forward Fulkerson algorithm, which runs in n cubed time. Then we can remove all edges with weights greater than the minimum maximal edge from the bipartite graph. And then after removing those edges, we can run the Hungarian algorithm with all edge weights in the bipartite graph being distances squared. And then this will return the MMD plus MSD squared assignment. Now this algorithm runs in just n cubed time and can scale to thousands of robots. Uh, however, unlike the MMDR role assignment function, the MMD plus MSD squared role assignment function is not dynamically consistent. Now, here's a comparison of properties of our two CM valid role assignment functions, shown in green, uh, compared to some other potential role assignment functions, including, uh, say, minimizing the sum of distances squared, uh, MSD minimizing the sum of distances, basically just running the Hungarian algorithm, uh, we also look at properties of a greedy algorithm that assigns robots to targets in order of shortest distance, and additionally as a baseline, just a random assignment of robots to targets. Now, in this table, we see that only our two role assignment functions uh, both minimize the make span and avoid collisions, meaning that they're the only two that are CM valid. And then also in this table, we see that MMDR is the only role assignment function that we compare that is dynamically consistent. Now, we have proofs for all of these properties, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, however, I think really seen is believing, and so I'd like to show you a video that shows some of these properties of the different role assignment functions. Now, in this video, the MMDR role assignment function is in the upper left, and the upper middle is the MMD plus MSD squared role assignment function. Now, uh, in these videos, yellow robots are being assigned to green targets, and when all the robots reach their assigned target positions, the background is colored green, meaning that the make span is completed. Now, you'll notice that with our two role assignment functions, the make span will be completed at least as fast as any of the other role assignment functions as they are directly minimizing it, uh, that make span. Uh, furthermore, if any agents uh, ever collide, uh, they'll be colored in red, which will, you will actually never see in our two role assignment functions. And then also in this video, if any robots ever change the targets they're assigned to, meaning that there is dynamic inconsistency, uh, we color the paths of the robot uh, light blue, and you'll see some of that in the MMD uh, plus MSD squared function, um, however, uh, not in MMDR as it's dynamically consistent. I think this video provides a, a nice visualization of some of the role assignment function properties. Now, we refer to the two role assignment functions and algorithms are presented as scalable collision avoiding role assignment, or SCRAM for short. As a quick summary, they minimize the make span and avoid collisions while also being scalable as they're computable in polynomial time. And we've shown that they can actually scale to thousands of robots. Now, just to give you a quick view of what this looks like in RoboCup, I think it's a bit easier to visualize this in the 2D RoboCup simulation league, which provides a top-down view with circles representing robots uh, playing soccer. In this video, we have two teams transitioning between U and T formations. The team in left and yellow is using the MMDR scram roll assignment function, and on the right is just a static or, or fixed roll assignment you'll see that the scram rule assignment function is completing the formation faster than the other team. And furthermore, it's never having collisions between the robots, which you do occasionally see with the static rule assignment function. Now, one last thing I'd like to mention about this, uh, while we've successfully used these Hi, Patrick. I think yes. Carlos has a question. Uh-huh. Yeah, so my question is related to, the, to optimizing the MMDR. So mm -hmm. uh, like in your role assignment algorithm, uh, I understand that every role is related to like a physical position in the field. Is That's correct. It, okay. So you, you like solve this problem and then you execute or you are solving this problem in like every frame? How does uh, we, we actually solve the problem every frame. Okay. And how do you guys, how do you guys, do you guys include any information about velocity? Because you know, when you start moving the robots, then this, this, the, the, the solution of the algorithm is going to change, right? Um, potentially. So what we do uh, is, uh, well, well, first of all, for, for our analysis purposes, we, we assume a constant velocity. However, in, in, in the robots, uh, we, uh, we uh, use kind of a hysteresis such that they do hold those positions for a little bit mm -hmm. um, so that they're unlikely to just quickly thrash like that if, if they're not moving at, at constant speeds as, as we presume them to be. Um, mm -hmm. Also, in, it's worth saying in the RoboCup 3D simulation domain, uh, it is decentralized. There is no centralized controller 
And so the robots to communicate through a voting protocol, and that also adds a little bit of a hysteresis uh, to, to them switching uh, uh, into different formations. Okay, okay, thank you. Yep. So one last thing I'd like to mention about this, uh, as I said, well, we've successfully used these role assignment functions in soccer. I think there are plenty of other applications for them, uh, including robots and warehouses fulfilling orders. But one other interesting application is for drone formation control. Now, during the opening ceremony of the last Winter Olympics, drones were used as moving pixels representing different images in the sky, uh, here transitioning from a snowboarder to the iconic Olympic rings. I think uh, they used maybe around 1,200 drones for this. And the role assignment algorithms are presented are directly applicable to, I think, interesting applications like this. So at this point, I'll, I'll quickly pause and see if there are any uh, further questions. Nope, okay. So now that I've gone over some core components and contributions of my dissertation that have made our RoboCup 3D simulation team successful, uh, I think it's important to mention that while it's nice to do well during the competition, the better measure of success is the research that comes out of competing at the competition. Uh, the contributions I've detailed are, are general in nature and aid in my research goals of being able to develop uh, complex multi-agent behaviors for autonomous agents and robots. So now I'd like to briefly touch on some ongoing work that I think also uh, contributes to these goals. Uh, the first of these, which I alluded to earlier, uh, is learning and simulation for the real world. Now, learning and simulation is great in that we can perform thousands of learning trials in parallel. Uh, unlike with physical robots, uh, we don't have to worry about humans supervising or setting robots. And in simulation, the robots don't wear out or break as they often do in the real world. However, if we learn a policy in simulation, uh, maybe a walk for a robot, and then directly try to apply it to a robot in the physical world, usually that policy won't work out of the box. And in this case, with this now robot, it just sort of falls over. So uh, what's learned in simulation does not directly transfer due to uh, what's learned in simulation overfitting to inaccuracies in the simulator uh, compared to that of the physical world. So I've been, uh, been involved in a project called Grounded Simulation Learning, uh, which is a framework for robot learning and simulation where we try and modify the simulator with real world data such that the policies that we do learn in simulation can directly transfer and work on the physical robot in the real world. So to give you a very high level overview of what we do for this, uh, we take some initial policy, say a robot walking, and then execute that policy several times on the physical robot, and then record the state action trajectories of that robot walking, where the states are the robot's current joint angles, and the actions are the different torques or, or target angles that's trying to assume with PID controllers. And then from that, we've used supervised learning to build a forward kinematics model of the physical robot. We then take that model, and embed it in our simulator in what we call a grounding function. Then when we're doing learning and simulation, uh, when our current policy asks for an action, such as moving the robot's leg uh, 10 degrees, uh, we'll take that action and run it through the forward kinematics model. And that might come back and say that that action in the physical world will uh, only move the robot's leg maybe five degrees. So at that point, we'll modify the action taken in simulation to just ask to move the robot's leg five degrees. Now, modifying the actions in this way makes it so the actions we're taking in simulation better match the actual state that would be produced by taking that action uh, in the real world. And we do this in an iterative process of learning and simulation and then trying that learn policy out on the physical robot uh, to collect trajectories for a, a new area of the policy search space. And then we can use those trajectories to learn a new forward kinematics model or a grounding function and then apply that back to the simulator. Uh, now, following this process, we were able to learn a walk it was 25% faster than the, the initial walk that we had started with. But here's a video of what this, uh, this actually looks like, um, which I should say was put together by a recent graduate student um, uh, from UT Austin, Josiah Hanna, who ex has extended this work by also learning an inverse kinematics model and simulation that was added to the grounding function. Now this video uh, first shows a walk we're learning in simulation that's ungrounded. So everything is being executed in simulation with uh, unmodified actions. Now, however, if we use our learned grounding function on that same walk in simulation, uh, the walk is a lot choppier and the robot barely shuffles along, which shows what would likely happen if we use that same walk uh, on the physical robot. Now, uh, back to the physical world. This is our starting point for learning, which is an initial hand-coded walk where we're collecting state action tra uh, trajectories from to learn a forward kinematics model. Now, it's about to see here, uh, after two iterations of uh, grounded simulation learning, uh, a robot will then have a walk, which was uh, purely learned in simulation that as you'll see right here, 
actually works directly out of the box on the physical robot. Now, this is a much faster walk, and to the best of our knowledge, is the fastest forward walk for a physical now robot. I think it's really a nice idea that we can apply what's learned in simulation to the real world, and this has a, a lot of potential for future work. So I'll now pause once again and ask if there are any questions. Okay. Now, the final topic I want to cover is some work on generalization for reinforcement hey, learning. Patrick, oh, yes. sorry, uh, I've been meaning to ask this. Uh, maybe this is a good time since you're moving from, looks like, robots to cars. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so when you play, uh, this is, of course, somebody who doesn't know this area, so keep that in mind, please. Uh, when you play video games, they have so-called physics engines too, like soccer games and things like that. Are those physics engines... I guess not very realistic. They're designed so that the player never falls and everything looks good and you look like you're messy in the game. Yeah, well, if you're playing a video game like FIFA or something, I mean, it's just right. for, for entertainment. And I mean, there you're not even controlling robots. You're controlling uh, pictures of humans moving around. Uh, it really depends on the simulator. There are some simulators like uh, uh, maybe Gazebo, a uh, robotic simulator that tries to be a little bit more physically realistic. Uh, it, it just really, I think, varies based on the fidelity that, uh, that they've incorporated in the simulation and, and how physically realistic they, they hope to make it. Um, although in, in video games, generally, the purpose is not to, to really have uh, realistic physics that much. It's more probably for entertainment purposes, because if you have really good physics, it can be a lot harder maybe for a player to control something. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Okay. Um, so the final talk, uh, topic I want to cover is some work on generalization for reinforcement learning. Uh, there are a couple of types of generalization I'm interested in. Uh, one is where a learned policy works on new unseen tasks, which it has never been trained on. This is known as zero-shot learning or, or generalization. And the second type of generalization attempts to learn a policy representation that can quickly be fine-tuned to work with new downstream tasks. This is related to transfer and uh, meta-learning. Now. The, uh, the image shown on the slide is part of some ongoing work at Microsoft uh, Research that I'm leading as a partnership with our Xbox studio that uh, develops the popular car racing game Forza. So first, for some context, uh, we've been using deep reinforcement learning to develop driving controllers uh, for specific cars, including the F1 car you see in this video, that's improved the existing game's hand uh, design controller lap times by 10 to 15% such they now meet or exceed the performance of expert human players of the game. Uh, and the learned neural network in this uh, controller, uh, for some more context, receives around 100 state features about the car, such as its velocity and tire slip, and then outputs control signals for steering, gas, and braking. So that's great that we're, we can learn a driving controller that achieves or exceeds expert human level performance for a specific car, but there are 800 plus cars in Forza, and it's just not practical or even really feasible to learn a controller for every car. Uh, ideally, we'd like to have a learn controller for one car work with a different car, such that it supports zero-shot learning or, or generalization. So if we were to say, try that same driving controller we learned for the F1 car you just saw on another car, a Bugatti Chiron, uh, unfortunately, it just doesn't work that well, and we just crashed our, our $3 million supercar. So although we can't use the learn driving controller trained with the F1 car with the Bugatti, uh, we found that the same driving controller does, however, work with other similar F1 cars. And additionally, we've discovered that we can train a controller with multiple cars, and that the driving controller worked with all the cars it was trained with. Uh, thus, when we train a controller with both the F1 car and Bugatti, it works for both cars. And then furthermore, supercars very similar to a Bugatti, like a Lamborghini, can also work with a controller, assuming we also trained it with the Bugatti. So now we can ask the question, can we train a drive controller across some subset of cars and then have that trained drive controller generalized to all cars? Now, choosing such a subset of cars to train on uh, requires us to know what cars are similar to each other so that we can gauge maybe if a drive controller trained with one car uh, will work with another. So this means we need a similarity metric between cars. And a first approach we've tried for determining similarity uh, between cars is to use 100 plus context features about each car provided to us uh, by Forza. Uh, we first used a linear lesser regression to select the features that were most important for determining a car's lap time, uh, as cars that drive similarly will likely have similar lap times. 
And this has told us that context features such as a car's zero to 60 time are very important. Uh, and it's also allowed us to automatically filter out unimportant features such as uh, the material of a car's roof, for instance. Then we performed a principal component analysis on the top context to decrease their dimensionality to three for ease of visualization, uh, which you see here in this 3D plot, where we've graphed the location of a sample of uh, 14 cars from the game, purposely chosen to represent different types of cars, uh, with the numbers in the plot uh, showing just the car's unique ID numbers in the game. Now, when we look at this plot, we see that the two F1 cars are, are grouped together, and we also see that the supercars like a Bugatti and Lamborghini are all grouped together as well. So uh, this suggests that using car context features to determine similarity between cars uh, for our domain has merit. Now, using this uh, similarity metric with our sample of 14 cars, we chose 10 cars to this train on that provided good coverage across the set of cars, and then evaluated the learned driving controller on the four remaining cars, which you uh, uh, see here. Now, while all the cars in these videos that are playing are using the same controller, uh, despite being very different cars, the learned controller works well for all of them. Uh, we also tried selecting a random set of cars to train on and found that the learned controller trained with a randomly selected set of cars did not generalize well to cars that, that weren't used during training. So I think the ability of a, a learned policy to generalize to new tasks and scenarios that wasn't directly trained on is an important direction for, for reinforcement learning to be able to scale to larger sizes of tasks. And this is especially true for real world scenarios like robotics with complex stochastic dynamics that have a, a high cost for training. Now, lastly, I'd like to mention another current project at Microsoft Research uh, related to the second type of generalization I previously mentioned, and that's for learning policy representations that can be fine tuned to work uh, with new downstream tasks. So we're currently exploring applying a BERT self-supervised uh, self pre-training to uh, RL. Now BERT pre-training is used as a state-of-the-art method for learning language models for natural language uh, processing tasks. And to better explain how we're applying it to RL, I think it helps to first give a, a simple explanation of what this means for NLP tasks. Now generally in NLP, uh, a sequence of tests, uh, text in the form of word token embeddings is uh, passed to a transformer network with uh, some of the tokens masked out. And then the transformer encoder, which is a type of neural network that accepts a, a sequence of inputs, decides what inputs to focus on or pay attention to uh, using a self-attention mechanism, uh, this transformer outputs an encoded representation of the input. Now this encoded representation is then passed to a classifier, which attempts to predict the unmasked values of the original masked input. Now after training is completed, the transformer uh, encoder part of the network is then saved and used to initialize the model downstream NLP learning tasks, uh, transferring and then fine tuning the weights of this pre-trained transformer encoder during learning of the downstream tasks has shown to be uh, really beneficial and has produced just uh, state-of-the-art results on a number of NLP tasks, including things like uh, question answering and sentiment analysis. That's kind of how it works in NLP, but we think BERT self-supervised pre-training can also be beneficial in reinforcement learning as like NLP, RL has sequential data. Now, instead of a sequence of words like NLP, however, the data in RL consists of observation, action, and reward tuples at every time step. To apply BERT pre-training to RL, we first uh, collect trajectories of these tuples from an agent or, or agents interacting with an environment, and then save them into a, a trajectory file. Then we can use these trajectories as input uh, data during self-supervised pre-training, where we mask out some parts of the trajectories and try to predict them. Now, the choice of what to mask out is a, an interesting one, which we think may relate to some different existing topics within RL. Now, one option is to mask out some of the observations. Now, when we mask out observations, our transformer model is learning a representation useful for predicting the dynamics or uh, transition function of the environment. And we think this is related to model-based reinforcement learning, in which an agent tries to learn a model of the environment so as to be able to, say, predict the effects of, of taking different actions. Uh, another option is to mask out some of the actions. Now, masking out actions results in a learned representation useful for predicting the actions that would be taken by the agent that, that generated the trajectory data. And this is similar to imitation learning, where the goal is to learn a policy that mimics or imitates that of another agent that is being observed. And a third option is to mask out some of the rewards. Now, masking out and trying to predict rewards may have some parallels to apprenticeship learning via inverse reinforcement learning, where the goal is to be able to learn the reward function that another agent, uh, often an expert, 
is using when completing a task. And then after self-supervised learning is finished, of course, we take our learned transformer encoder weights and transfer uh, and use them to initialize the weights of a model in a downstream RL task. Uh, so far, we have some early preliminary results for BERT training uh, when masking actions for an agent in a simple uh, maze domain here. In this experiment, an agent starts at a random point in a maze and is allowed to move up, down, left, and right in order to reach a goal location in the maze while only observing what is in the, the maze cells directly next to it. Uh, trajectories of an expert hand-coded agent were recorded for several different maze configurations and then used as input for the self-supervised training phase. And then after pre-training the learn transformer encoder, uh, we then transfer to a downstream RL task in which an agent uses an extra critic deep reinforcement learning algorithm uh, to learn a policy for a new previously unseen maze configuration. And so uh, having done this, uh, looking at the learning curves on the downstream task, we see that if we initialize the weights of the model with those learned during, uh, during self-supervised pre-training and then fine tune them during learning, which is shown in the uh, dark blue curve, this provides a slightly faster initial learning rate than if we just fine tune a transformer encoder initialized with random weights, which is shown in light blue. And additionally, if we don't fine tune the weights of the transformer and just keep them fixed during learning, we see a significantly better performance when using the weights of the learn transformer encoder, which is shown in orange, uh, as compared to just random weights uh, as shown in red. So what these results suggest is that BERT self-supervised uh, pre-training can be beneficial for learning downstream RL tasks, at least when masking actions. And we're uh, just now starting to explore uh, uh, other masking uh, options for, for masking or other parts of trajectories like observations and rewards. And we're also attempting to apply this type of pre-training to more complex RL tasks, such as uh, playing Atari games, uh, but we don't yet have results for those yet. Uh, still though, given the early initiative positive results for, for pre-training using masked actions on a, a simple domain, I think BERT self-supervised pre-training is a potentially uh, promising new direction for RL, uh, and which I'm, I'm quite excited about. So now I'll just briefly pause again for questions before I, I quickly wrap up. So I guess a very quick one then for this part. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're uh, so this is Santiago by the way so when uh, when you're using your transformer for NLP then clearly each of these entities which are let's say words I mean there can be you know different part of uh, speech tags and everything but they are all words right but here you have states actions and rewards which are intrinsically very different entities right so if you just incorporate this into a transformer there, there might be a bit of a mismatch there so how you handle that yeah that's a that's an excellent question uh, so certainly states uh, can be very different depending on the task. Uh, they could be just simple discrete values like in our maze, or they could be uh, uh, pixels uh, or some continuous values or something like that. And, and so uh, there, there are multiple ways to handle that. One way is to pre-process them somehow uh, in some pre-processing layer before they're passed to a transformer. Uh, that's one way we're looking at going about this. But it's also certainly the case that we don't necessarily expect that uh, any particular learned transformer expecting a certain, a certain type of states will, could then be used with any other arbitrary, completely different downstream task with maybe a different type of uh, state space or, or action space, which could be you know, discrete, continuous, or even some combination of that. So generally for this downstream tasks, at least initially, we're trying to make sure that they have at least the same observation and action tasks. Uh, or observation and action spaces. Does that uh, kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so now I'll, I'll just quickly wrap up. Uh, to wrap up, I, I'd like to mention a few other research topics that I've worked on as sort of a, a further picture of my research interests and background uh, within robot soccer. This includes ad hoc teamwork, where robots from different teams have to work together without any prior coordination. I think kind of like a pickup soccer game. I think this provides a lot of interesting open research problems. And then I've also worked on some interdisciplinary projects, uh, such as training a model of a cerebellum to be used for fall prediction uh, with members of a neuroscience department, and also comparing how human infants and robots learn how to walk uh, with members of a psychology department. I think some of the most interesting research problems occur at the intersections of different disciplines and plan to seek out interdisciplinary collaborations uh, in the future. Now, looking forward, some of my longer term research goals are to develop intelligent autonomous agents or robots that are robust to changes in their environments and can adapt to new surroundings. Uh, I'd like for these agents to be able to learn new skills in an online manner and have capacity to work with other agents without prior coordination. 
and to have, to have these agents uh, be able to persist for indefinite periods of time and ideally exhibit lifelong learning characteristics. Now, while I believe the research I presented on hierarchical learning, uh, multi-agent coordination, some to real learning and generalization for reinforcement learning are steps towards meeting these longer term research goals. Uh, there are quite a few research topics towards meeting these longer term research goals, which I'm passionate about exploring, uh, a few of which I've uh, just listed here. And then I believe that they provide a good foundation for a research agenda for the, the next five to 10 years and beyond. So with that, I'll stop and, and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Virtual clapping. Yeah, uh, yeah very, very interesting. Uh, we have time for uh, questions from folks. This is Rich, by the way. So I have a question, and it mm -hmm. is, uh, you mentioned this at the very, uh, it, it just like a couple slides ago, but mm -hmm. uh, what can you say about, uh, uh, well, there's different things that could be called, but robustness issues. Um, you know, in, you know, in particular, you know, issues like you know, verifying that an agent really is going to behave, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, but like it was designed, uh, like it was designed to behave, right? Any thoughts about that and how that fits into uh, fits into your your work or your research program? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, robustness in, in reinforcement learning is uh, uh, kind of its own separate area. Um, also has some relations to safe reinforcement learning where you, you want to uh, ensure that you, at least with some very high probability, uh, stay within some certain uh, constraints of, of something. Uh, th those are, are areas of interest of mine that they're not something I've directly worked on uh, uh, to this point. However, I, I will say that some of the, the work in uh, generalization uh, may be able to uh, allow for certain uh, perturbations of, of your environment where you can then uh, potentially say that uh, we expect it to be uh, robust uh, to a certain range of, of variations in our environments such that we won't uh, do something really bad. Um, there's also some areas related to uh, adversarial learning uh, yep. where you can try and uh, have uh, some, you know, uh, I guess uh, uh, contracts or whatever, or, or uh, saying that, that you, you can kind of uh, uh, guarantee uh, w within a certain amount of, of noise or something that, that you will still be uh, robust to, to some uh, level uh, against that. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, got it. Uh, other, thank you. Other questions? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so another one here. So, we, uh, when you have these different cars, right? So, and this is a, this a question that I, I, I thought about. So, I, so I would like to also hear uh, uh, your take on this, right? So, let's say that you you have training data for ten cars, and then you want to test on an eleventh car, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If if one of these ten cars is very very similar to the eleventh one. You might be better off just training with 10% of the data with the model that is very, very similar to you. Let's say in the extreme is exactly the car, right? And then if you start incorporating cars that are further and further apart, you would be incorporating, let's say, more noise than signal. Uh, so how is, is there a way to try to better understand this trade-off? You know, better data but more noisy in the sense that they come from different system might be start to hurt you at some point. Is there any way to think about the trade-off? Uh, maybe. So uh, we, we've actually found it empirically in this domain that even if cars are very different, as, as long as they're uh, both part of the training test, the controller will work well with, with both of them, which suggests maybe the neural networks we're using have a, a very large capacity uh, for kind of representing different policies um, within them. Now, it, it is quite, quite possible, though, that if you don't have that capacity in your neural network, if you are training a lot across a lot of different uh, uh, tasks, uh, let's just call them, uh, such that they're really coming maybe from widely different places in, in your uh, ideal policy space or from different distributions, you could be injecting some noise into them. So one way to think about it is that maybe if we could uh, try and better cluster the similarity uh, that we may expect certain tasks to be similar, then maybe it makes sense to just to specifically train on different clusters 
and that could uh, potentially uh, uh, reduce the, the variance there. Um, that's maybe one, one approach to it. Um, I'll also say, though, that there are a number of uh, different ways of, of doing these types of generalizations. Um, there's also things like uh, domain randomization, uh, which you can just try and train across a whole bunch of different environments and then hope uh, or, or expect that with some perturbations, uh, your learn policy that's robust or does well across a bunch will then also be able to kind of uh, generalize, generalize to uh, a new environment uh, kind of out of the box. Um, I, I'm not sure if I, I best answered your question there. No, no, yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So uh, I have I, one last quick one, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, but is there, this is more of a naive, not, well, this is, this is probably too, uh, well, I'll reframe my too naive question. It was too naive, but now I'll, I'll reframe it. So um, are, there, there are some folks who, uh, like Ben Recht in particular, who's at Berkeley, who, who he grew up as a control was person, who argue that uh, you know in some applications, uh, and and maybe not the kind of applications that are as complicated as yours, but in some applications, we should just be using good old control theory, you know LQR control, rather than you know data driven RL type, uh, uh, or or in particular deep RL type uh, algorithms. Do you have any? opinions on 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 those uh that that argument that's going on you, i mean it may be yeah just any thoughts would be useful yeah um i, I think uh like lqr controllers and, and such uh can work uh very well uh particularly if, if the model is not too complex and and they're easy to compute and reason and, and plan about uh I, I i wouldn't discount them as a solution whatsoever I think, though, when you don't really understand the, the full dynamic of what you're doing, maybe you don't have a, a nice model such that you could could use uh, uh, those uh, ideas from control theory, that's where uh, a neural network can, can really be an advantage as it can kind of uh, uh, learn a model for you um, yep. in that context. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay, yeah, thanks. A mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Oh, thank you. And, uh, yeah, really interesting talk. And uh, we, I, uh, we will be. You're, you have some meetings tomorrow as well, right? Uh, I do. Yes. Yeah. So uh, some folks who are on the on this talk are going to be meeting with you tomorrow, and uh, so I invite you to have a a delightful uh, virtual faculty candidate dinner tonight uh, <laughs> and we will pick things up uh, in the morning. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank okay. You. See you. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Ciao, everybody. Thanks okay, so much.